All right, ladies and gents, here we go. Um, thank you so much uh, for watching part one. I know there's a lot of information. Holy shit, I'm low. Hold on. Hold on. There we go. Hello, I'm here. Okay, so a little housekeeping before we jump in. I wanted to address some comments. Hello, uh, newbies, people who um, I haven't seen in here before. Clarissa, hi. Um, hi, Qbert. And one solved. Thank you so much for joining. It's actually your comment um, that I wanted to address before we got into um, the insane amount of information that I have to put out there tonight. So, um, <clears throat> All right, guys, fair warning. I'm getting a cold. I can feel it. Um, so I'm a little froggy this evening. Dana, what's up? All right. So one solved mystery. And um, if you guys are interested in finding out all the nitty gritty, all the details on all of this, on everything having to do with uh, the JonBenet mystery um, head on over to One Solved Mysteries YouTube page. Um, I have spent the better part of the last two days watching every video on that page. So uh, big ups to you, uh, One Solved. Um, there is a lot of information there and I cannot, I, I can't absorb and reiterate everything. Obviously, um, this human, I cannot, I don't know his name. I apologize. Um, but this, this person has put out so much information about this, um, about this mystery, about this unsolved murder. And, um, seriously, if you're looking for detail, if you're looking for good, um, solid, uh, source of information, one solved, head over there, give them a like, give them a sub. It's fantastic stuff. So, I just wanted to address um, some of the comments that once all left on my last, uh, on part one of this. Um, somebody had commented during the last live that um, John Ramsey and Beth Halloway had gotten married. Um, that is a rumor. They were, they did meet and they did bond over, <clears throat> excuse me over um, the loss of their children. Um, they became friends. There are rumors they dated, but she is not the woman that he married her, his wife, his new wife. Her name is um, Jan Russo. I hope I pronounced that correctly. So, um, and apparently they're very happy together. So happy for John and um, yeah. So it didn't, uh, Beth Halloway, unfortunately, not true as a part of this story. Uh, further, let's see, we've got, um, oh, the Christmas bonus thing. So <clears throat> we, uh, in the last episode, stated that um, the $118,000 was the amount of John's Christmas bonus. It was actually um, the amount of his bonus from 1995. So it was paid out in February of 96. Um, it was not the current year, it was the previous year. Um, let's see what else was there. There was like one other, um, by the way, one solved your comment was robust. So I apologize if I miss anything. There is a lot here. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll go back to this. Um, if I think of anything else, um, yeah, there was something, something about the house being set on fire, but We'll go into that later. <clears throat> Please forgive me for all the throat clearing and the frogging ugh, tonight because I can feel it. This weekend's about to be miserable. So when we left off yesterday, um, also before I get into talking about the suspects, well, the people of interest that I wanted to get into tonight, I also wanted to say, um, look, Nobody knows who did this for a hundred percent sure. 
it's it's a lot like the Karen Reed case that we're all thinking about all the time now. Nobody knows. Nobody knows who actually did this. So my opinion is mine alone. You form your own based on what you've learned, what you glean from what I say and what you do in your own research. Um, my opinion is that it was an intruder. I personally don't think the family is guilty of this, but that's my opinion. And again, I haven't learned all there is to learn about this case because I haven't watched all of Winslow's videos. So um, I'm getting there though. I've, I've made my way through um, season one and part of season two. So just FYI, big fan over here. Um, and <clears throat> for those of you looking for um, another good source of information, uh, OneSolve actually got me um, into this site through his videos. Um, it is called acandyrose.com. Uh, the person who runs this site, let me share the screen too so you guys can see it because it is, speaking of robust, this is robust with a capital R. It is nuts. So this person has compiled all of this, and like literally anything that you're looking for, it's here. So you want depositions, you want transcripts, you want interviews, videos, photographs. Actually, I'll pull up some crime scene photographs from this site later too, because um, <clears throat> they go to what I'm going to be talking about. But um, yeah, so if you're looking for a very large source of information, acandyrose.com, and then just click on the banner halfway down the page. Um, I believe it says something like Flight 755. Uh, 15th Street, which is, of course, as we know, uh, the address. So, um, all right. So I think that is everything. I will link, actually, by the way, I'll throw a link up in the comments um, and in the show notes on this for both Un uh, OneSolve's channel and for um, A Candy Rose, because it's, it's really interesting stuff, guys. If you want to jump in and get real deep into this rabbit hole, that's that's a good place to start. So I have already now <laughs> taken um, probably another 10 or 15 pages of notes here just from watching uh, one solve shows and sort of trying to consolidate everything that I had written down, just notes here and there about who could have been responsible. Um, so... For those of you watching familiar with the case, this may not be the greatest order to have things in, but I'm just going to jump in from where I started taking notes on this and we'll go from there. So, um, and as we go along, oh, it's Barbara Refner. That is the name of the person who runs a candy rose. So, um, yeah. So definitely, definitely, definitely. I tried, Tracy, I tried, but I, mm -mm. <laughs> I tried. I got a lot of information here. I watched a lot. Um, a lot is up here and in, in my trusty notebook, but I am by no means an expert on this case. If you want an expert, definitely go where I'm directing you because there are some experts here for sure. Okay, so when we left off, we were talking about the possibility of a an intruder. Um, now, uh, I don't know. Did I address um, Lou Smith when we were here last on Wednesday? It's all kind of a blur because I'm half dead <laughs> with a cold and stress and stress. So, okay. Um, yeah, let's go into Lou Smith. So the Boulder Police Department... Um, I don't know exactly how he came in. One solved, if you've got it, put it in the comments. Um, Lou Smith, who was a veteran detective who has, <clears throat> excuse me, this insane solve rate for the cases that he's been working on. I mean, the man is, he was a superhero. He was amazing. And they brought him out of retirement to come in and work on the Jean Benet Ramsey case. Lou Smith originally was brought in and thought, like the police did, that the Ramseys 
were responsible for this. It was recommended to Alex Hunter. Okay, that makes sense. Um, so Lou Smith comes in. He starts working on the crime scene. He starts um, questioning the Ramseys, most importantly. He was one of the um, big interviewers of, of the Ramseys. Um, and he came in and looked around, looked at the entire scene. Um, he was the one who actually was able to climb into the window, the aforementioned broken window. And I'll pull up a picture of that, actually, now that I have everything in one place. I'm serious, guys. This Candy Rose site is no joke. Okay. So let's see. We get the windows. Where are they? Um, here we go. Okay. Let me see if I can blow that up a little bit and I'll share it with you guys. So, okay. So this is the set of windows. There we go. Let me see if I can make it bigger. I'm going to make myself tiny. There we go. Okay. So here are the windows. Now, um, this middle window is the window in question, the one that was broken. Um, and this window can be accessed from outside. Uh, let me grab that because there is a grate over it. I thought there was a picture here. Maybe not. But like I said, this site is insane. Uh, there's a close up of the window. So let's look at that. It's kind of hard to tell from this picture, unfortunately, but the cobweb in question was in this lower corner right here. Um, when we talk about the cobweb that was intact, it was in that lower left-hand corner, as you're looking at it, this corner right here. Um, oh, shit. My computer's dying. Hold on, guys. Um, I forgot to plug it in. Trying to get everything ready tonight. I neglected my electronics. Anyway, so this window is what... Um, what was looked at originally as the as a supposed point of entry for an intruder into the Ramsey home. Um, personally, I'm not 100% convinced at all that if an intruder came in, that this is how they got in. Here we go. We're charging. Okay. Whew. There we go. All right. Anyway, I don't buy it completely, but that is me. Yeah. Uh, I was just getting to that one. So the, the Boulder police said that a fully grown man couldn't fit through that window. So detective Smith proved them all wrong and did it on video. Um, he was able to climb through the grate outside, no problem and drop down through the window. Um, okay. I, there's the grate. There it is. There's the window sill from outside. So there were disturbances here and here that were pointed out. Um, and here's where, here's the middle window right there that was broken and was apparently what the police thought someone would have climbed in. Um, I'm trying to, there's the picture of the grate. There we go. So this metal grate is what was over the window. So in order to get in, I don't know if you guys have seen that video. Maybe I can try and, um, <clears throat> maybe I can try and pull up that video of Lou Smith. Um, if it's on here, that would be fantastic, but I'll pull it up in a minute. Um, so yes, the, the neighbor, oh my goodness. Um, the scratches on the wood in the last picture. Let's see. What are you talking about? Which one? This one? It's just dirt. It looks like. Um, or were you talking about the the last picture I brought up of the the window from the top? This guy. Mm -mm. Right here, box. Is that what you were talking about? Yes, Ben. Um, that is that's a big point of contention too that the window had been broken for months. Apparently, according to John Ramsey, he had broken the window um, to gain access to the house one day when he forgot his keys. Um, I mean, it was a basement window. No one's down there very much, um, but it is Colorado in the winter. So there's going to be some drafts. So 
Apparently it was broken during the summer, um, which, you know, obviously it's not going to be a problem then unless you're trying to keep AC in. Um, but in the winter, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. So, um, yeah, that is a finished basement. At least parts of it are. Uh, the window in question is in Burke's train room. Um, I also have a floor plan of that basement if it'll help you guys. It's kind of blurry and it's black and white, but I'll pull it up. Um, let me share that too. Here we go. All right. There we go. Okay. So the window is up here in the top portion of the picture the in the train room, which is kind of an oddly shaped room. Um, and then you have the boiler room right here. Um, and pay attention to this air duct because we're going to refer to it later. Um, and then this is the wine cellar. This is the room off the boiler room where, as we know, JonBenet's body was found by her father. So, um, what, Karen? I'm sorry. I don't know if you're in the right place. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, that's another good point. One solved. It was a 7,000 square foot home. It was a very, very large home. Um, they did ask, they did ask someone, uh, the housekeeper's husband to fix it. Um, it was not fixed, but, oh, I see Karen. I see. Okay. But, um, it hadn't, he hadn't gotten around to it yet. So, all right, that is the window. And that was what, um, the theory of the intruder was based around was this broken window, this stuff on the wall underneath the window. I'll pull that up too. Um, and of course the, the infamous suitcase, which that, that was the other thing I wanted to bring up guys. Um, one solved set me straight on the fibers found inside the suitcase, um, were not actually from the clothes that Jean Benet had been wearing earlier in the evening. They were from the clothes that she had on when she passed away. Um, so thank you once again, un uh, one solved. I keep wanting to call you unsolved. I'm sorry. Um, We'll get to that unsafe. That's kind of half my point here. Um, so let me pull up that scuff so you guys can see it too, because this was a large point of contention. So going back to this window picture um, right here on the wall, the resolution on this picture is garbage when I expand it too much. So it's going to become kind of iffy to see it, but there is a scuff right here on the wall and there was a quote unquote pea sized piece of glass and some dirt found on top of the suitcase. So here we go. All right. So we've got the window, right? The window's broken. There's some, um, there's some things in the basement and around this window on um, both inside and outside that would lend to the impression that somebody broke in using this window. Um, that is not the only way that someone could have gotten into this house. Um, and it is very, uh, it's very well known now, at least, that they were not very good at locking their doors. Um, apparently, they were not very good at, um, they were not very good at, closing their doors even. Um, because according to a neighbor, the door on the side of the house that came out of the butler butler's kitchen, one of these rich houses, man. I, I don't know what a butler's kitchen is, but it was behind the kitchen on the first floor of the house. Let me get a floor plan so you guys can see what I'm talking about. Um, there was a door that led to outside from there that was found to be not only unlocked, but a jar. So that um, also lends to somebody not even breaking into the house, but possibly just walking in. Um, there was also, um, and I have a note about it, and I'm sure it'll turn up as soon as I stop looking for it, but there was... Um, a key, apparently 
Um, they had quite a few spare keys to the house and not all of them were accounted for. Um, I don't know if that is true. I'm not reporting that as fact, obviously, but I'm not sure if that's true. Um, Scott Gibbons, thank you. Jeez, one salt. God, I'm, I'm going to send you an invite. You can just come on. This is crazy. <laughs> you have all the facts for me. I love it. So, um, yeah, the butler, butler kitchen door was ajar. Um, so another theory aside from the window break in is that somebody just straight up walked into their house when they were out at dinner, um, at the white's house. So someone could have just walked into that house. I mean, just, just strolled right in. Oh, thanks, Gina. I don't get a lot of love on Twitter, so thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, thanks for joining, first timer, second timer. I don't think I've seen you here much. Um, okay, let's see. So, all right. So we have a, yeah, the boots, the boots, the boots. We'll get to the boots. Um, like I said, there's just so much to this. I'm trying not to, not to get off track. So we've got a potentially... A wide open door. We've got a broken window that was ajar and potentially any number of people could have just walked in. So who, who do we like for this? Um, the police apparently had a list of over 200 people, um, that they were looking into for this, but we're not going to, um, we're not going to go on that list because that is insanity. We'd be here for three days trying to go through all that. So I'm going to work off of the list that I um, was able to find through One Solved, through a Candy Rose, and um, through looking at interviews with Lou Smith. Um, thank you. I appreciate the new follow, Gina. I hope we keep you entertained. Um, so we've got, okay. So Lou Smith, when he was brought in, Initially, he was brought in to help the police prove that the Ramseys did this. Um, and throughout his investigation, it was two doors. Thank you. The French door. I forgot. Um, picking up my slack. Thank you so much, One Solved. So Lou Smith eventually began to sort of stray, according to the police, to the side of the intruder theory rather than the family theory. So he started looking into this short list of suspects. I say short and I mean shorter than 200 people. So Lou starts looking into, yeah, unsafe. It could have Lou starts looking into everyone under the sun. And I'm going to just work off a short list because we have Karen. If you log in, um, if you watch us on YouTube, instead of Facebook, you're going to be able to see all the chats. Um, cause it's moving actually faster than it usually does. Um, Fox, can you post the YouTube link for Karen? If, um, if you're able to, I would appreciate that so she can participate. Um, okay. So the first person that we're going to talk about, because there are so many of them, um, first person that we're going to talk about is the first person that I actually wanted to rule out based on what I had heard about this case through news reports, through documentaries, and um, <clears throat> through, um, you know, reading the, um, the book Perfect Murder, Perfect Town, I believe it's called. Um, that's, that's, touted as the preeminent book on this, but there are many, many, many books, uh, written about this. And that's, um, that's just one of them. And there, there have been a lot of things that came out in that book that have since been proven wrong. So I wouldn't use it as a source of information, although I will say that the author is talented and, um, kept me interested. So the first one, the first person that I want to focus on, his name is Bill McReynolds. He was the um, Santa Claus at the Ramsey's Christmas party. And um, there was one reason that immediately my mind went, oh, well, it had to be, right? 
Um, Bill McReynolds was the Santa Claus. Lauren Schiller is the author. Thank you once again, Wenzel. Um, so Bill McReynolds was the Santa Claus at the Ramsey Christmas party on December 23rd, only a couple of days before Jean Benet's murder. And um, Jean Benet had said something to the effect of Santa Claus um, said that he was going to visit me a special visit after Christmas. Um, and that sort of, I mean, again, it's, it's, it's a secondhand account of something that, um, that a six-year-old said once. So you can't give it like an enormous amount of credence, but at the same time, it's, it's Christmas and you've got a Santa in the house who was paying what other people said was um, a strange amount of attention to Jean Bonnet. He, he paid a special amount of attention to her. And um, just got to say, this guy, Bill, super convincing Santa Claus, super duper convincing Santa Claus. He was perfect. Um, it turns out that Bill, of course, um, is not good for this because um, he had actually had surgery. Um, he had had, I believe, heart surgery, um, bypass heart surgery um, in August of 1996. Um, so he wasn't really in... Um, <clears throat> physical shape to be like first off breaking into someone's house if the window was the point of entry he was very large to fit into that space um he was not physically well enough i don't i don't think and police didn't think either that he was physically well enough to carry out all of what occurred here so they they cleared him based on the fact that he wasn't in, in physical shape. Also, I believe he had an alibi. Um, I think he was home with his wife. He was drinking scotch and um, he took some prescription medication and went to bed. So he was not, um, he, he was not, he was an early suspect and someone they looked into based on what um, Jean Benet had said, but he was cleared relatively quickly. But in my mind, when I heard, there we go, her friend's mom, Barbara, Kostinik, um, that she would be getting a special visit after Christmas from Santa. That's, that was the quote. So I heard that and I went, well, boom. obviously it's that guy, right? It's Santa. <clears throat> and, um, yeah, here's another, another reason why police initially looked at him. His daughter had been kidnapped around Christmas years earlier. So it sort of, you know, it was telling, it was daunting. So, of course, he's looked into because he is a man who's in their house at some point and who paid special attention to Jean Benet. So um, happily, he was cleared. And uh, yeah, so the next guy I want to look into quickly. <clears throat> I don't know if she did pageants. One solved, do you, do you know? Yeah, that was, um, that was another reason <clears throat> that I liked him for this quickly, but again, um, cleared pretty quickly, not, um, truly a suspect, thankfully. So, uh, the next guy that I want to look into quickly, cause again, like he was, he was cleared. Um, and this was based on the, I don't want to call them confessions. It was, it was. It seems now that I've read all the way into it, it honestly, it seems like a revenge thing. Um, but this woman, what was her name? Mm -mm -mm. Johnson, Bernice Johnson. Uh, she, um, at some point was putting out there the theory that her baby daddy named Todd Foos was responsible for the murder of Jean Benet. Uh, there were several reasons she gave for this. Um, first off being that their daughter, and I shit you not, this child's name is Cinnamon. Their daughter Cinnamon was also in pageants, um, some of the same pageants that Jean Benet 
was in. Um, they were, of course, of different ages. I believe Cinnamon was was like in the very tiny, not infant, but like under one or under two category in these pageants. So they, of course, weren't peers. Cinnamon was much younger than Jean Bonnet. Um, <clears throat> but from what that uh, this woman, Bernice Johnson, told authorities from prison, by the way, um, is that Foose used to watch the kids changing. Um, he has a lengthy criminal record. He was apparently an expert at breaking and entering. Um, <clears throat> and he talked about coming into a specific amount of money around uh, about a month before the murder. So he's saying that he's <clears throat> going to come into 50 or $60,000 before Christmas of 1996, like obviously your antenna is going to go up. Um, also, he's got a criminal record. He is creepy around children and was present in a place where Jean Benet was at the same time. So, <clears throat> sorry about the throat clearing, guys. So, people call that the pageant dad theory. Um, let me see if I have a picture of the guy. It's not going to matter because he's not really, um, he's not good for it. <clears throat> he has been cleared. I'm trying to remember how I have it in my notes somewhere, but Todd, Todd Foose. I don't have a picture of Todd Foose. Um, but yeah, Todd was cleared. Um, he didn't get the money he was talking about. Oh no, but I have a shitload of water here. This is what we're working with, guys. I've had like six of these today. So we're we're double fisting coffee and water. There we go. All right. Yeah, Kevin, that's a point too. Um, the fact they didn't lock their doors, the fact that, you know, certain doors were even left open at points is kind of, it, it's kind of funny because, you know, you think, well, why break a window if, you leave half your doors unlocked all the time. I mean, this is a huge house. Like I said, huge, huge house. <clears throat> so it's possible that this was routine that they left doors unlocked, but it could have, you know, that day, it just so happened that there were two doors, um, not only unlocked, but open. So uh, Foos didn't get the money he was talking about after the murder. Um, he was eventually cleared, I believe, by DNA, um, because, again, we're talking about that, that good sample. Um, and I did learn something else with regard to DNA. By the way, Tracy, I know you're here. Um, you were the one who put me down this rabbit hole to begin with. So just wanted to let you know um, that we did find out why. <clears throat> no, Gina, I don't think you did. Um, yeah, that is a specific number. It's a really, really specific number. And we'll get into, um, a couple of ties to that number too, um, because there are a couple of suspects that have sort of a tie to that. Uh, but talking about Todd Foos means you have to talk about Michael Helgoth. And Michael Helgoth was a mechanic who worked, well, he was an electrician, but he worked at um, a junkyard. <clears throat> Excuse me. They did look into that unsafe. I'll get into that in a few minutes. Um, Michael Helgoth, personally, as far as I'm concerned, I like M Michael Helgoth for this for various reasons. Um, but the story goes um, from Bernice Johnson that Michael Helgoth and Todd Foos worked together and because Todd Foos was also talking um, about coming into 50 or $60,000 to a coworker of his. Um, he called it a killer deal around the time of the murder. Um, Michael Helgoth, there's a lot of reasons why people liked him for this. Um, he's one of the more convincing suspects to me. He might be my number one suspect. Again, I'm not an investigator. I by far do not know all there is to know about this. Um, but from what I understand, I like him for it. Um, but the interesting thing about Michael Helgoth 
there were a lot of interesting things about him, but <clears throat> one of his coworkers, um, John Kennedy, Kennedy, um, he was the one who talked about Michael Helgoth. Um, and apparently Michael Helgoth had an accomplice that he allegedly worked with on this, but it wasn't Todd Foose. It was a man named John Gilgax. And we'll get into Gilgax in a minute. <clears throat> Gilgax has his own ties to this, um, but I want to talk about Michael Helgoth. Michael Helgoth was a creep. He was a huge, huge creep. From everything I've heard about him, he had the desire to hurt people. He hurt cats. He would shoot at people. Like, he would routinely have a gun with him, and he would shoot, like, right next to people's heads. Like, heads up. He was super creepy. Like, he is the exact type of guy that you grow up with as a kid who's going to, like, chuck rocks at your head when you're on the playground. Like, he is creep supreme. Um, he, but, but, um, the day that Alex Hunter gave his statement, um, back in February of 1997, um, he, Alex Hunter famously, and I'll pull it up, made a statement saying that, um, we're narrowing down the suspect list and pretty soon the only name on it is going to be yours. Like we're going to find you. We know who you are. Um, the day after that, the day after Alex Hunter made this statement, Michael Helgoth allegedly committed suicide in his home. But I, he was found on the 15th, right? Um, I don't buy for one second that Michael Helgoth committed suicide. And I will tell you why. The, um, first off in Michael Helgoth's bedroom, when he was found, there was a stun gun next to his bed, wrong brand, by the way. Um, the brand of the stun gun that, uh, Lou Smith was able to match up to, um, the wounds on JonBenet was a specific brand. It was like air gun, I think was the name of it. Um, God, see, I've got too many freaking notes here, guys. I believe it was air gun. Um, yeah, one solved. I agree with you a thousand percent. There is no way this guy killed himself. And here's why, okay? I know that at least one or two of you guys has seen crime scene photographs, has looked at bullet trajectories, you know, any of that. Air taser, thank you. Air taser stun gun. <clears throat> they found it in the house. It wasn't the one next to his next to his bed, like on the end table. They did find one in his house because I believe he had one registered to him. But if you're looking at the, the photograph of Michael Helgoth after he passed, like from the crime scene, there's a stun gun right there. But what you'll also see in that photograph is Michael Helgoth laying with his head partially elevated on the bed, his right hand up like this, left hand down at his side, a gun down by his right leg, top of his right leg, facing his body. Now, there was also found at the scene a pillow with a bullet hole and burn marks on one side and an exit hole for the bullet and some blood on the other side. And this guy apparently took his gun, pointed it at his own chest and angled it up. So up like this and so the bullet trajectory entered in into his rib cage but exited higher up so this bullet had a trajectory going up this way so is that a way i mean at least me personally i don't see somebody taking a pillow putting it over their own chest taking their gun from the opposite side of their body angling the gun up and shooting themselves, but then being able to take the pillow and move it away and put the gun over here and put their arm like this. No fucking way. No way. So the guy was suicided, in my opinion. 
I don't think that he killed himself. Um, oh, interesting. One salt with some info that I didn't know. It was a tape recorder near the body that the family claims has his confession on it. Wow. They're making people pay $10,000 to listen to it. And is that, that I assume is Helgot's family, correct? I mean, I don't know. Why would someone want him on a live Fox? Good question. I mean, if he was involved in this and let's not make any assumptions, like he could have been involved in this. He could have. I don't, I don't know for sure. No one knows for sure. He could have been involved in this, but if he was and he got spooked by Alex Hunter's statement and started talking to somebody who maybe was in on it with him um, saying like, I think I'm going to turn myself in or, um, Oh my God, they're going to catch us. Like we need to run or we need to confess or whatever. The other person involved would have a motive to dispose of him. Correct. So, I mean, why not? You know, there is a motive there. Like that makes sense to me, but that's a, a reach because we don't know if more than one person was involved in this. We have no idea. We have no idea who was even involved in this. So there's, you know, like I'm starting to feel, I'm starting to feel a little bit like that picture I showed at the beginning of Charlie Day. Um, yeah, starting to feel a little bit like that. So yes, Gigax. All right, let's do that. Let's talk about John Gigax. Um, Gigax is another one who had... Um, like some things that were like, ooh, ooh, that makes sense. Okay, yeah, but the DNA, the DNA. There we go, the DNA. Good call, Tracy. Let's talk about that before we move on to Gigax. Actually, let's talk about Michael Helgoth's DNA. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, um, huh. Michael Helgoth's DNA doesn't match. It, it's it's not a match so for the sample that they have now. Okay. He's, he's not a match. So that, that like to me says, okay, well, he's not the person that gave that DNA. Does it mean that he wasn't involved at all? No. Does it mean that he can be cleared a hundred percent of any involvement? Possibly, you know, um, we don't know. He could have done it. He could have gotten somebody else to do it. He could have been involved somehow. But then we move on to Gigax. David, my favorite's here. Holy crap. How's it going, buddy? Um, we're going to talk about uh, Gigax now. We're going to talk about John Stephen Gigax. So um, apparently he was never actually a formal suspect here. Um, but Gigax, he's got some things. Um, and I, I need to once again, shout out to OneSolved because OneSolved is the person, um, that, oh yeah, there were, yes. Um, uh, OneSolved is the person who first uttered that name that I, that I heard, you know, I've never heard of John Stephen Gigax before yesterday. Um, I have no idea who this guy is. But now I've got a little bit of information. One solved has got a hell of a lot more than I do. Uh, but there were a couple of things that um, pointed to Gigax um, that I, I wanted to touch on quickly before we move on. But um, there was one other thing about Helgoth before I get there. Um, Helgoth... And again, his DNA didn't match, but he was such a creep. I feel like I need to say it. Um, Helgoth said to somebody, um, I wonder what it would be like to crush a human skull. I mean, like, sure, people who are into true crime or are giant creeps will sometimes think things like that. But why would you say that to a friend? Like, that's... Ugh. Um, also he had a pair of high tech boots in his house. And, um, I don't know if you guys remember from Wednesday, but there was a boot print 
found on the floor of the wine cellar in the Ramsey home that was from a high-tech boot. Um, the police said they tested the boots that came from Michael Helga's house and that they weren't a match. Um, the size was different, so I'm not sure. Whatever came of that, because there was a lot of, they're just not a match. They're just not a match. We don't have a ton of information on how that wasn't a match. But if they weren't the same size, that ends that pretty much. I think they feel to me the presence of the high tech boots. Uh, it was the brand of boot. Um, let me pull up the boot print because that will make that make sense. I didn't have one the other day, but now I do. Um, let me grab that boot print. Lou Smith for the win. Um, I know I just saw a picture of it. There we go. Uh, there it is. There it is. Okay. Now this is going to be super hard to see. Um, so let's, let's try. Let's try. Okay. So I don't know if you can see it. Let me zoom out a little bit. It might be more obvious right here. It's H I dash T E C. You can see it right here. And this is a zoomed in photo of the um, boot print that was found on the wine cellar floor next to near JonBenet's body. So there's another, there's another angle of it. So you can see some of the tread right there and some of the name right there. So there is, um, I can do fish. Very cute, Dave. So anyway, um, the presence of an, unrelated stun gun and those boots in the room with Michael Helgoth's dead body to me, along with the fact that he was very obviously not a suicide victim, um, just scream set up to me. And like, if we're going to talk staging to me personally, that feels like, Hey, look at this. It feels, it feels very obvious. It feels super obvious to me. Um, again, He's not a match on the DNA, but, um, yeah. Okay. Let's talk about Gigax now. Um, John Stephen Gigax was apparently, um, friends with or colleagues with, um, Michael Helgoth and Gigax, like there were a couple of things that really stood out about Gigax. Um, excuse me. There was unidentified animal hair apparently found um, at the crime scene, which matched wolf dogs that Gigax raised. Um, nine markers, yes. Nine markers and then stretched to 10, supposedly, based on what I was able to find. Um, but actually, let me get into that really quick, too. You guys are making me bounce around. Um, there was also a an auxiliary hair found on the white blanket that John Bonet was wrapped in. Um, I say auxiliary hair because some people, um, I'm sorry, because they can't say exactly that it's a pubic hair. Um, but an auxiliary hair can come from the pubic area. It can come from the stomach. It can come from apparently even arm hair. I don't know. Um, yeah. Yeah, I took the words out of my mouth here. Um, Mr. Dove is, no, okay. Um, okay, so yeah, the hair, I don't know. They have mitochondrial DNA on that auxiliary hair, apparent pubic hair. Um, we're not, uh, like, I'll get more into what I found on that, but there wasn't a whole lot. Um, <laughs> could his DNA miss those? I don't know. I don't know the specifics at all about how DNA works, like none. Um, I am the wrong person to ask about that. So uh, if we can get an expert on here to talk about DNA, that would be great. Um, okay. So GigX. So there were some unidentified animal hairs found at the scene that matched, that were an exact match to wolf dogs that were apparently raised by GigX 
in his home. So there's one thing. Um, he had a history of violence. He had a history of sexual assault. Um, and he was a known pedophile. Dave, you want to come on? Show sure enough. Um, I will, let me grab a link for my bud and, um, I'll send it. I'm going to send it on Facebook, Dave. Uh, no, I'm not because Facebook's not going to work. All right. I'll email it to you, buddy. Um, okay. So here we go. Let's do... Sorry, guys. Let me do this and grab an email for David. All right. Um, that would be fantastic because uh, I don't like just talking by myself. This will be fun. So everybody, Dave McGrath is going to come and join us, hopefully, um, if I can get my Gmail to work. Just give me a second. So a three out of three plus dog hair. Um, I don't I don't know why they didn't look into him further. Um, I know that he insists that he had relocated to Indiana at the time of the crime. He said he brought receipts um, to talk to the police. So apparently um, he was able to say that he was living in Indiana, say that he was in Indiana during the time of the crime. Um, Dave, I just sent you that. Um, I had to email it because I'm on my computer. Um, okay. And okay. So the big thing with gig X though, the big thing that I wanted to bring up with John Stephen gig X is that he had, um, ties to a blue Astro type van. Now a blue Astro type van. And I know that's like a weird thing to say. Let me see if I can pull up a picture of the van I'm talking about. Cause y'all know it. Everybody had one back in the 90s. Somebody you know had this van. Um, let's see if I can pull up a picture because it is hilarious. Um, anyone of my generation is going to be like, oh, yeah, of course. Um, so there was a blue van, a dark blue Astro type van um, seen outside the Ramsey house. And let's see, I've got a, an accounting of that in my notes. Let's see. Uh, uh, um. Oh God, so much crap on that. So the Astro type van was seen by neighbors on the 24th. Apparently this is allegedly on the 24th, 25th, and 26th of December. Um, it was observed outside the Ramsey home on Christmas Eve. It was observed parked, um, traveling north and stopping, traveling north on 15th Street and stopping in front of the Ramsey home. And then on the 26th, it was seen parked in front once again of the Ramsey home. And this is by Jean Fortier. I don't know what significance she has. I think she was a neighbor. Um, I honestly did not look too much into that afterwards. I was just kind of writing down what I was able to find out from some of these videos I was watching. Um, oh man, let me see if I can find the picture um, that I was looking at earlier because this uh yeah so it was sort of okay i will i will two houses to the south see once again one solved for the win all right let me try emailing it again hold on yeah i can't i can't text it guys i can't do that um i can yeah. All right. Hold on. I will text it to you, David. Uh, 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 uh. Okay. Uh, Streamyard. .com. Don't you guys love this? All right. So. FGS. C. Four key. There you go, buddy. 
All right, so hopefully that works. Um, okay. Anyway, so I didn't email it. I sent it via text to Dave. So hopefully he got that. Um, if he didn't, I will also email the link to the unsafe spaces email. Um, this is one. All right. So that is also emailed to the unsafe email. Okay. So enough of that. All right. So here we go. James. Co yeah. I was going to get more into James Kohler. Um, the, yes. Okay. So are we talking about, yeah, two men sitting in the van? Okay. That's interesting. I don't know that I heard this particular story about two people sitting in the van the night that, uh, so this would have been Christmas Eve night that John Ramsey went over to the Barn Hills house um, to get JonBenet's bike from their basement because he was hiding her Christmas present over at their house. Um, they had a boarder, Glenn Meyer, we'll get into him in a little while also. Don't think I'm forgetting that guy. Um, so let's see, where were we? Gig X. So he had ties to this van, uh, which was the same type that was seen outside the Ramsey home three days in a row, apparently. And um, that's what we have on him, that he was tied to it. Um, apparently, the police were not super interested in Mr. Gigax. Um, he says he's innocent of this. I don't know. Like, I mean, given his history, um, the dog hairs are kind of um, something that leads me to believe that either he had something to do with it or somebody who had been in his home had something to do with it because those hairs being a, an exact match, that's, that's pretty crazy. So we've got, let's see, we've went through Helgoth. We've got Gigax. Um, let's talk about, um, well, let's get, oh, there he is. Let's add Dave. He's here. Hello. <laughs> hey, buddy. Hey, how are you? You're on my channel. I'm so excited. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Doing great. Um, love the. We were talking about John Bonet last night. I was. I didn't think you were going to do a part two so quick. I thought you were going to space it out a little bit. I wanted to. I really like while it was fresh in my mind, while I was um, crazy walling it like Charlie Day. I really wanted to get it out there, um, and just kind of put it to bed because there is. I mean, you could take this case and literally make a career out of putting videos out there on it. And I know, um, you know, one solved is one of those people that kind of has gone so deep into this. I, I feel like, you know, I'm going to leave that to people who are that far into this, that deep mm -hmm. into this, because mm -hmm. I want to look at other cases also. I don't want this to kind of take over what I'm doing, but I also, well, that can't, that can't happen. You can become obsessed and that's it. Yeah. Do anything. Yeah, I don't want to be that guy. Like, I but don't want to be that guy. But, but I think it's also kind of hard to, like, spread yourself thin over a million little cases, too. You know, I, yeah. I don't think that's... <clears throat> I think it's nice to just focus on, like, five or six different... Like, that's what I do. I have, like, three or four obsession cases. And the yeah. other ones, like, if somebody asked me, like, about Delphi or something like that, I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's that guy's probably guilty. But, like, don't ask yeah. me, like, deep things about it. You know, I don't fucking know. Yeah. So I don't have time. I, only I have, have passing knowledge. That's it. Right. Well, you know, um, like it's similar to what I did with Molly Bish's case. Like I like getting to a point where I can comfortably speak from, you know, beginning to end essentially about a case that I'm interested in. So with Molly's case, you know, I'm, I'm taking that from beginning, going through all the suspects, going down there, taking video, like, that to me is a robust piece of work. And that's what I want to do on this channel. I don't want to just say, hey, this case happened, the end. 
Like I want to be able to right. put information out there for people who are watching, but I don't want to turn my channel into just for reporting on one case. Cause I feel yeah. like then I'm yeah. just going to go, you know how crazy I can go over one case, you know, I can go a little overboard. Yeah. Well, you're definitely the OG of the Molly Bish case. Oh, geez. You know? So things, I mean, maybe we'll go back to that at some point and talk more about it. Cause there is so much still there's so uh -huh. much. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. There's a lot. Well, so happy who do you Friday, like for everyone. this? Huh? Mm -hmm. Huh? Uh, who do you like for it? Um, well, like I said earlier, anybody but the parents, because like everyone focuses on the parents and um, there's like, when parents kill a kid, they have a tendency to soften the scene. Like if Jean Benet was like found like wrapped up like in a blanket or like they'll even sometimes like they'll put their kids toys next to the victim like parents have a tendency to do that when they kill a kid and that obviously didn't happen here it was a brutal scene so i don't like the parents for it although there's a lot of weird shit around the parents too like mm -hmm. it's the ultimate who done it like i think we were talking about it yesterday like this case is the ultimate who done it it's the biggest it really is craziest well i don't know if it's the craziest true crime case of all time i don't know no it's definitely um, not. yeah probably not you're right but it's definitely up there it's top five and um, go outside and get daddy like I told you yesterday, I just think I believe in the intruder theory. I think just a random sex offender living very close to that neighborhood who got focused on John Bonet and became obsessed with her and knew her comings and goings and knew how he could get to her and have time with her. So, um, yeah. And unfortunately, we don't have DNA. So this case will probably never be solved. Nine markers. So there is DNA. Right, Dave, but it has a, it, it has a short amount of markers, though. Yeah, so, it's you know. not. Uh, it's nine. I guess it was stretched to ten. So unfortunately, there's not enough to do that familial genealogical test. Um, right. There is enough to exclude people, though, based on this profile. So they have been able to supposedly they have been able to exclude quite a few of the suspects that we're talking about. Um, but what do you have? You read. Um, the profile that John Douglas yeah. drew up on this, yep. on this person. Mm -hmm. So what are your thoughts on this having something to do with uh, John Ramsey's business? Cause that was the next thing I was going to sort of address here. Well, yeah, I think, I think too, the other thing that really, I have read the profile, obviously Douglas, like you've known me for a long time. You probably <laughs> No, I mean, I probably quote Douglas like three times a day when we talk sometimes. You know, he's I, the hero yeah. in our, yeah, in our little, uh, in our circle. He's definitely one yeah. of our heroes. For sure. And I think the part that probably points towards John's business is the fact that whoever wrote that letter wrote down the exact amount of money and the bonus money that John had just gotten in the company. So that would be something that would only be known to like, people he was in business with or mm -hmm. like a family member or, or the father himself. So yeah, I think that's as good a theory as any, but I mean, if you read about the case, I mean, they tracked down everybody that he ever been in business with. They took DNA. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, they completely ruled that out. So there, yeah, well, kind of fucking, it, it's one of those things you run into um, a lot of stumps, you know? Yeah. I mean, well, there's and and our, our friend here, one solved mystery. Um, has spoken at length in his videos about a woman named Sandra Henderson. Mm -hmm. um, she was an employee at Access Graphics who had um, embezzled 145 uh, something to the tune of $145,000. Um, she and her husband, Bud, ran a company called Henderson Technologies, which ran up a tab at Access Graphics for somewhere around $145,000 um, and didn't pay it back. So she uh, supposedly had a promissory note with Access to pay this money back. She forged Bud's signature on it, didn't right. pay them back. Right. Uh, they, they fired her. They cut ties with Henderson Tech. Um, and then they sued Bud's business for one hundred and forty k um for restitution in uh like the early 90s 93 i believe and um 
she she then goes on to different companies and commits more embezzlement, more fraud, finally gets tagged, goes to jail for this. And she was actually in a halfway house at the time of Jean Benet's death. So she was living in um, like an outplacement, like an offsite sort of halfway house, like not in prison, but not out of custody entirely. Um, and she was free to come and go. And she had a car. So she checked in, but late the night of the murder. And then went out afterwards to apparently go to the bank um, after 8 p.m. on the night of Christmas. So, like, was she, does she have an alibi? No, she does not. Um, there's also a couple other strange things, but um, apparently the amount of money that she and Bud each owed Access Graphics at the time of Jean Benet's death was eighteen thousand dollars. Yeah, and but how, how how would she be connected to the Ramses though? Just curious. I don't I don't know this name, so she was fired from Access Graphics, which is by John, John Ramsey. Okay, 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 yeah. okay. Sorry, I didn't clarify that, but um, yeah, I mean John Ramsey was running the company. I mean, it was ultimately owned by Lockheed Martin at that point, but. And they are the ones that actually came in and were able to sort of see what was going on. Um, but ultimately she worked for John and she, and he was the one who would be blamed for her getting fired. I mean, okay. at least in, in her mind, I guess. Um, but yeah, she wasn't, she wasn't in the halfway house. Um, and then like the other thing that sort of stood out to me and again, Again, I'm going to implore you guys, like anyone watching, if you want details, if you want a deep, deep, deep dive into Sandra and Bud Henderson and their kids, go to One Solved Mysteries page and watch his videos because they are so, so good. Um, I love I, uh, I've never heard of One Solved Mystery. Uh, I'll have to catch up with them. And, uh, oh, this this guy, he commented on my first video. Um and had so much detail to clarify and, and provide. I was like, geez, what do your videos look like? And it's just a plethora and it's, it's all so detailed. So I was like, all right, yeah, let's, uh, let's get in on this. <laughs> so um, apparently, and the thing, the thing that really like went ah to me about Sandra Henderson was when she was first in trouble for this fraud um, she had transferred ownership of a black Jaguar convertible to her biological son. And um, apparently one of Bud Henderson's sons also owns a black Jaguar convertible, which is the vehicle that was seen driving up and down the dead end street that the whites live on um, during their Christmas dinner that the Ramseys were present at the night of John Bonet's death. And that's not a super common car. It's yeah. just not. <clears throat> that's so. a lot of uh, that's a lot of information for a Friday night, man. I know. <laughs> I know. Blame my blame my new friend. I mean, yeah. honestly. One solved mystery. Follow me on Twitter, man. Let's talk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He is knowledgeable. So um, yeah, I'm gonna put your link in my show notes, one solved, and I'm also gonna link up that uh um uh cherry rose website also so um what do you know about john mark Carr too uh i know he didn't do it weirdo uh yeah he's just a weirdo i when i first heard that um i i obviously got pretty jacked up i was like wow right. you know, this thing's gonna get solved this dude sounds good for it he's a pedophile um the sort of uh thoughts I had in my head were definitely, you know, this guy's done this before, mm -hmm. very confident, you know, he goes in the home, he's probably pretty seasoned mm -hmm. and we, we have a repeat offender here. So this guy hit all those markers, but of course he wasn't even in Colorado at the time. So right. um, no now I, be I believe now he's a woman, isn't he? Isn't he a yes. woman? Yeah. yeah. I believe his name, her name is now Alexis. I, yeah, think. I, I can't remember. Yeah. I can't remember. Mm -hmm. But we're not we're not gonna get into your thoughts on that. You're not gonna get my channel. I was gonna <laughs> say, please don't bring that up right now because you're, you're you might get tossed off just for having not me on right now. 
Yeah. I wish I had those glasses with the nose and the fake mustache. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. Again, again with the win, one solved. Yeah. Alexis Reich, Reach, Reich. That's my know. boy. That's my boy already. I know this guy. I'm telling you, we got to meet up. If you live in this area, I'll buy you a coffee. I bet you don't, but we promise we won't. We promise we won't kill you. Yeah, no, we're not those people. <laughs> we will not kill you. Um, I, I, like one of the the only other one I really wanted to bring up while I was on the subject of the suspects here was this guy Scott Carruthers. Have you heard of him? I have not. Okay, so Scott Carruthers was the leader of a cult. Um, yeah, a cult. He's a cult guy. And I know everybody loves talking about cults. So we're going to get into it real quick. It's not a huge thing um, that we have on this guy Carruthers, but it's a really interesting thing. Um, so there was this cult out of Baltimore called BDX um, that Scott would, he was like recruiting people for this, um crazy shit he was doing i don't it had something to do with aliens honestly i watched a whole thing about him and like i literally i just i can't do it with the cults like it's never been a thing that i could really understand i, I guess i just yeah. don't have the mentality for it why do but, people overlook like why do people overthink this stuff though like i don't know it's got to be like a cult or it's got to be like no it's just some it's probably some random fucking creep who lived down the street who fixated on her and like it's Occam's razor, right? Easiest. You know, That's it's what, usually yeah. Steve and I were talking about that last night. Like what's the Occam's razor here? If it wasn't the family, what's the simplest explanation outside of that? Like personally, I don't think it's a guy who leads a sex cult in Baltimore, Maryland, who mm. thinks that the alien overlords are co communicating to us right, right, through right. cats. That like, sounds up, that sounds up my so alley. Much. But I mean, it's not every, so much. Not everything it's is so the grassy much. knoll, bro. Don't be extra. You know. <laughs> I know it was it was so much. It was so so much. Um, yeah, bootleg Scientology. Exactly, Fox. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. It's it's a whole lot of weird. And again, like, I just, I don't think I have the personality to be taken in by a cult leader, but like, who knows? Um, Used to be in my cult. I don't know. I don't know what hey. Happened. Oh. <laughs> me, me, you and We're Kevin. Like, yeah, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, we have that. And then, so this guy, Scott Carruthers, um, the link was through that woman, Bernice Johnson. She said that Scott Carruthers had hired Todd Foos to carry this out. Um, I just, I don't know. I don't know if I buy it again. Like, I don't know if he was even ruled out fully. Um, Cause he was just all, I didn't have anything to do with this. And that's that. So there was, I mean, he wasn't, it was proven that he wasn't in Colorado at the time he was in Baltimore. Excuse me. Um, okay, weird. Okay. Um, so he was in Baltimore at the time of the crime. He didn't, um, he, he wasn't there. He wasn't, you know, he was ruled out based on that, apparently. Um, so, yeah, crazy cult guy. Not a thing. But the B, um, the way that the ransom note, the sign off there, this was like where this whole thing came from. Um, the sign off, as you know, of the ransom note was victory, SBTC. Have and you read the whole ransom note yet? Yes, I've read the whole ransom note. No, I mean out loud. No. The no, last you... part, the last part is the best part. Don't try to grow a brain. Don't try and grow a brain, John. Yeah. Don't try. That sounds to me like somebody who knows him, though. Yeah. I don't know. You know, I always say like, oh, it's. Oh, okay. no. <laughs> oh, there he is. Okay. Hey. You dropped off for a second. What were you saying? I always say like, oh, it's somebody who didn't know the family and it's just a random intruder and stranger abduction, a stranger killer. But that that to me sounds like someone who like knows John to say mm -hmm. something like that, you know, so. The, well, the line about uh, use that good Southern common sense. Yeah. yeah. Um, he's not from the South. So that was kind of a weird thing. Um, it uh, like a lot of these, Gina, actually good point. 
Um, a lot of what was contained in that ransom note was taken either paraphrased or directly from movie quotes. Um, I believe there is a quote um, from Speed. I think that Don't Don't Try to Grow a Brain came from the movie Speed, that Keanu yeah. Reeves uh, yeah. masterpiece. Um, mm. Dirty Harry, I think there was a line from Dirty Harry in there. Um, I think Ruthless People was another one of them. So exactly. They likely knew that he and his business had come from Atlanta, but that's not where he was originally from. Um, yeah. So he where was he from? Was he from Colorado? No, no. I, uh, I don't know exactly where he was from. I forget. I thought he was from like um, Virginia or something like that. Uh, Virginia? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I'm sure Winsold will fill us in because I can't remember exactly where he is from. I can bring up the ransom note. I, I thought he was. I thought he was from Pepperell, where all the weirdos are from. Oh, you shut your <laughs> face, David! Stop doxing me. I might oh, flip out at you. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. yeah, I can bring that up. No, can we uh, just address how much of a homo Jesse was then? Like that that was that was a yeah. lot. That was yeah. a lot. Yeah. Jesse yeah. had Jesse had some issues about it. Yeah. Uh, let me see if I can zoom in. Whoop. Listen carefully. There we go. Okay, so I just got to say, though, like, regardless, um, oh, Lincoln, Nebraska, see, one solved Jesus. with the might, win once again. Might as well be from Indiana or something. Lincoln, Nebraska. <laughs> okay, so um, right off the bat, by the way, the other night on uh, Wednesday when we did part one of this, I tried writing with my left hand, and Ransom was showing in the theaters. Yeah, I couldn't call Good call. Ransom was there too. Oh. Um, when we were doing the um, first look at this ransom note, I tried writing some stuff with my left hand. And like these, the way that this kind of comes out a little bit shaky, like right here in this H and this W right here, it just, it looked the same as that when I tried writing with my left hand. So that was something I was like, well, this this looks like somebody was trying to dis disguise their handwriting. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Do you want to read it, Dave? Like, we can, we can have a reading. I can't really see it. Oh, okay. Um, sorry. Uh, that's okay. But, but it is a great note, and it, it is key to finding clues, I think. But, I mean, people could probably just follow along, right? Uh, yeah. And that one hundred eighteen thousand dollars that was the exact amount that his bonus was going to be. So that's key too, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, properly sized attaché. Oh, I want to address something actually about that. So this one line: make sure that you bring an adequate size attaché to the bank. Yeah. Now our boy here, one solve. I actually looked into how large $118,000 would be when it was broken down exactly how it was asked for here, $100,000 in $100 bills and $18,000 in $20 bills would only be about like eight and a half inches tall. So um, any bag apparently would have been an adequately sized attache. Just FYI. <laughs> I thought that was something like just really, really interesting um, that our friend one solved looked into um, on this. Like, it's just, it's so much information. First off, it's just, this letter is, is super telling to me. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not a, a profiler by any means. I know we were going to try to start that thing with Kevin, but that kind of went nowhere for now. Um, what are you talking about? What do you mean? The profiling project. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, okay. Ben, what makes you say that? I'm curious. Like, I don't I don't disagree with you, but I'm curious as to Wait. why you think it was a male writing it. Because um, I've actually, I've looked through this and I've watched a bunch of stuff on it. And there are a couple of things in here that come across specifically as maternal. Um <sighs> As in, like, this line right here, the two gentlemen watching over your daughter do not particularly like you. <laughs> so I advise you not to provoke them. That's such gentle language. Like, super yeah. gentle language for someone saying, like, we're going to behead your child. 
but right. these guys don't particularly like you. It just it it's a contradiction. All of it is a contradiction. It's so weird. Um, because right here they said like if you speak to anyone about your situation, like police, FBI, etc., it will result in your daughter being beheaded. Um, that's severe. But then then they go into some movie quotes. If we catch you talking to a stray dog, she dies. Right. And I think we all know um, that this is almost a direct movie line. Um, but I believe it was, um, if I catch you talking to anyone, even a Pekingese, then she dies. Something like that. So, okay. Many reasons. Let's see. Uh, the penmanship, the phrasing, and the tone. That's interesting. That's interesting. I mean, what do you think, Dave? Do you think a guy wrote this? Yeah, definitely a guy. Um, yeah. Definitely a male who committed this crime. For oh, sure. for sure. And for sure. I didn't realize how many fucking movie quotes were in this. That's bugging me out. Yeah, right it's now. like four different movies. It's nuts. Yeah, that's bugging me out right now. Um, mm hmm. That's interesting. Pissing on a lamppost. Yes. A Pekingese pissing on a lamppost. There it is. Thank yeah, you once again. That's interesting. Oh yeah, I God. think a male wrote this. It's a it, I don't know about I don't know about the penmanship. I mean, my penmanship sucks, but I know I girls mean, this their penmanship so, sucks too. So like, yeah. I feel like regardless of who wrote it, they were disguising their handwriting, at least in the yeah. beginning, because you can see it sort of smooths out here. This is the end of page two. But at the beginning, if you go back to the beginning of page one, it's really, really shaky right here. Like it's really, it's super obvious, especially the second sentence right here, that they're trying to either disguise their handwriting or they were having trouble holding the pen or something. Yeah. Um, John's name is mentioned a lot, Ben, especially at the end. But right at the beginning, he's addressed as Mr. Ramsey. And then at the end, I believe it's John three times, like right in a row. Um, don't try to grow a brain, John. You're not the only fat cat out there. Don't underestimate us, John. It's up to you now, John. Yeah, that's shit that dudes say to each other, you know, not not females. That's my opinion. Again. What the don't grow a brain stuff? Yeah, don't don't try to grow a brain and also like, you know, shit like it's up to you and um, you're not the only fat cat. Like, I don't think, I don't the think a fat cat thing that. threw me off too. Is that not yeah. a weird phrase to use? Uh, like outside the movie? Phrase. That would show me like, is maybe somebody's age, like that, mm. things like that were said, you know, yeah. of an, in a different generation, you know, 1970s, 1980s, you'd hear that a lot. So um, yeah, it seems know. like a gangster movie phrase almost. Right, right, right. Yeah. I don't know. I might start using it more now, actually. So. Oh, I'm totally going to start yeah. calling people fat cats now. Yeah, let's bring that back. Let's bring that back. <laughs> oh, yeah. We're, we're going to reclaim that. Um, mm -hmm. That's an interesting point, Unsafe, too. Maybe their adrenaline was pumping and they calmed down a bit. Um, to me, honestly, I'm not sure that the note was written like... So, like, in my mind, and this is my opinion, personally, I think that these, whoever committed this broke in, well, broke in, walked in through an open door um, while the Ramseys were away at dinner and took their time. I mean, there's drafts of this note. Like, they're, yeah. it's exactly, exactly one solved. Exactly. It goes to something Smith said. Like, no one's going to write this after murdering yeah, no. a little girl. They no they wrote it beforehand. I really think that they were just kind of hanging out in the house and wrote it. And the plan was to kidnap her. I think that that was the initial plan. I don't think this murder was planned from the outset. I really, really don't. Maybe it just went too far, right? I think she woke up. Or maybe she woke up, right? Maybe it was I just think a that fight. what had happened was she got hit with that stun gun in her room. They threw her over their shoulder and just walked down the stairs with her, placed that ransom note. Maybe they went down to the basement because they were going to put her her in a in that suitcase. I mean, the fibers from her clothing were found inside that suitcase. Sure. So, I mean, maybe that was the plan, carry her out in the suitcase. Maybe not. I don't know. But there were 
um, statements made from two neighbors that heard a scream between midnight and 2 a.m. on the right. night of John Bonet's murder. Now, how how do you hear a scream from inside a basement? Right. There was an air duct, <laughs> and this was a whole thing on um, Geraldo, apparently. Um, but there was an air duct in that boiler room that led right to outside. And if you're screaming into that, it's going to project the sound outside. So maybe she ran and they caught up to her in there. I don't know. I don't know. But I, I kind of feel like this was a kidnapping. It was planned as a kidnapping. And it went awry. Shit hit the fan. I mean, how else are you going to explain the murder weapon coming from inside the house? If right. it wasn't yeah. family. Right, right. No, no, you're, really you're, pro you're probably tracking. You're probably tracking right. It's I been so long, but we should do another deep dive on this soon. Oh, yeah, for sure. I would I mean, love to help, too, because I, I feel like I'm going crazy doing this myself. So Yeah, I hate that. I hate this. Some cases are, like, just so, um, so like, sometimes, like, hopeless that it's, like, do you even want to get into it? You know what I mean? So, yeah. Yeah. This is I, yeah. Scene. I'm I'm looking into another one right now that it's just like is there there's not really any information on it so it's really really hard. I think it's um I think it's Steve actually. Yeah, it's it definitely me. I'm gonna I'm gonna jump off Dubs. My service sucks, but I'll talk to you soon. Okay. Okay. Thanks for joining, Dave. Of course. Thanks for hanging. Yeah. Goodbye, everybody. Have a great St. Patrick's Day. Talk to you soon. You too, bud. Bye bye. Bye. A guest. A guest. Um. That's, he's the inaugural guest on my channel. Hooray for David. Um, okay, so we went through that. Oh, yeah, I wanted to go through this. Um, one solves comment because that's what I was getting to. Um, and it was back on that floor plan. So let me pull that back up because it's really interesting, um, the, the air duct thing. Um, they had a whole breakdown it was dr oz it wasn't geraldo apparently but let me share this and there we go okay so again her body was found right here in this wine cellar and here's the boiler room now the air duct is right here now if we recall patsy and john's bedroom is on the third floor of the house. Um, so you're like, and they did say that they slept with their window cracked. Um, but you're not gonna, you're not gonna hear anything in the basement from the third floor. Um, and if she did scream and it, the sound was carried out this air duct, it would be heard from outside, but it wouldn't be heard from the third floor. So thank you actually for correcting me on the show once solved. Um, I wasn't, I thought it had been Geraldo, but, um, so yeah, that's another good point, Fox. Like that she made no sounds potentially because she had just been hit with a stun gun. Um, you know, if she was hit with a stun gun, then, uh, maybe she's unconscious. Maybe she is in shock. Like, I don't know what a six-year-old's body would do um, when hit with a stun gun. Because I'm not a sicko. I have no idea. Um, I do know what it would do to a grown man because I've seen that happen. And, um, you know, maybe it knocked her out. Maybe um, they now, we also do know uh, that Jean Benet had a piece of duct tape over her mouth when she was found by her father. So what if the tape was already on her mouth? And yeah, Ben, good point. Oops, sorry, sorry. There we go. Yeah, good point. Um, stun guns can render people unconscious, apparently. So my thought after reading a lot of information on this, and by no means, again, have I read everything because there's just so much. Um, but my thought is that this person, um, was hiding in the house 
and when the Ramses came home from dinner at the Whites, um, everyone, you know, settles in. Apparently, Burke and John Ramsey were building a model that Burke got for Christmas or a toy um, after Jean Benet was apparently already in bed asleep. Um, okay, so that makes sense. Oneself, I remember hearing about the lip impressions, but again, I, I don't know. So. I guess my thought is that this person was hiding after everyone's asleep. They go into Jean Benet's room. Um, now stun guns are super loud. If you're just holding it there, like just holding it, not touching anything with it and hitting it, it's extremely loud. But when it's placed against skin or onto a pillow or something, it doesn't make much noise at all. So again, we're talking Jean Benet's room is here. John and Patsy's room is on the third floor. They're not going to hear every little sound. And like any parents, you know, obviously they're going to be vigilant enough to hear their kids if they get up in the middle of the night, but maybe they're not listening for every single sound that happens. So we've got this little girl who has stun gun marks. Apparently she was hit on her lower back. Um, and maybe that rendered her unconscious. They could just toss her over their shoulder, walk down the stairs with her. They place the ransom note. And then for whatever reason, they go into the basement and I'm stuck on that suitcase. Again, fiber evidence isn't totally a hundred percent accurate as someone already pointed out, but there were fibers found inside the suitcase, but there was also a blanket with John Andrews semen found on it in the suitcase as well. So we don't know, but I think that the plan was to carry her out inside that suitcase and just walk out with her. I don't think the window had anything to do with it, honestly. I think that that um, John Ramsey's account of that window being broken is accurate. But again, what do I know? I'm just a rando who did some research. I have no idea. So I think that what happened was she woke up and I think since she had another stun gun mark right here, I think that they tried to hit her with it again. Um, I think that she woke up, started trouble. They tried to hit her with it again. She screamed, you know, so we don't know. We've also got this, yes, a urine stain on the carpet out in the boiler room outside of the wine cellar door. Um, so again, and the blow to her head, from what I understand, didn't cause external bleeding. I think it caused more internal bleeding, but it wasn't a huge amount. Um, and that, again, that's another thing that seems to be an issue with this case was, you know, the what came first. Was it the blow to the head or was it the, um, the strangling? And what we do know is that that first of all the blow to the head would have killed her eventually um that was a fatal head wound but we also do know that she was killed by means of asphyxia so did it happen first or did it happen after we do know that she struggled because there were half moon impressions in her neck um it appears from her clawing at the the cord that was used. So presumably she was conscious or at least conscious enough to fight um, when she was being strangled. So um, yeah, there we go. Eight to 10 cc's on the brain um, post head trauma. So once all, I would love to know since you're such a wealth of information and I'm, I'm not being facetious here and being serious. I would love to know what your thoughts are. I would love to know what all your thoughts are. Um, but our resident expert in the comments, I would love to know what you think the series of events was, um, in Jean Benet's death. Um, yes. And there was petechial hemorrhaging in the eyes. So she, she definitely was there, um, was alive when she was, um, strangled. So, um, yeah. So just let me know, like, I would love to know what anyone, um, anyone thinks. No, 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 no. Inside, it, it was a brain bleed. 
that she had. Um, there was, I believe there was only a spot or two of blood inside her underwear. I don't think it was eight to 10 cc's. I think that eight to 10 cc's was the brain bleed. Um, but one solved, if you could clarify, that'd be great. Um, <clears throat> Cause I, I don't think that there was that much blood in her underwear. I could be wrong, but um, yeah, I'm almost positive. That's, that's what, um, one solved is talking about. Sorry, I'm throwing a lot at you, one solved. Uh, okay, so did we uh, did we talk about all the suspects I wanted to address? Um, I believe so. Um, mm -mm -mm -mm. Yeah, I think that was everybody I wanted to really go into. Um, there was a boarder who lived in the basement of the Burn Hills home, which is across the street and up one from the Ramsey house. Um, this guy's ex-wife did say that she thought that her husband, ex-husband was responsible for this. Um, okay, Ben, let me see. No blood, at no outside blood from her skull. But there was internal bleeding. There was a brain bleed. That's what I'm talking about. Um, yeah, Karen, I'll get into that in a second. So Glenn Meyer's ex-wife, Charlotte Hay, is the one who says that he did it. Um, she says that he had severe anger issues. Um, he, he was a little obsessive about the case. He had clipped out every article. Um everything about the Jean Benet murder case. Um, he acted super suspicious. He was creepy around young girls and violent towards young women. Um, and sex was very, very important to him, but we don't know. Uh, he was 64 in 1996, had a ton, ton, ton of death, uh, debt, not death, had a ton of debt and, um, moved out pretty quickly after Jean Benet's death. So there was that guy. I don't think there was anybody else I wanted to touch on really. Um, I mean, there's a lot. There's a lot of super peripheral um, sort of, yes, he moved to Indiana. That's correct. Yes, yes. So um, again, there were hundreds of people looked into on this. And there were quite a few that were ruled out pretty quickly. But again, like we don't, how, what standard are the police using to rule these people out? Do we know? Like, because DNA, um, they don't have DNA on all of these people. They were able to rule some people out based on the DNA profile that they have, but are like, not all these people gave blood samples, gave saliva swabs, gave hair, gave handwriting analysis, like not everybody they looked at gave all that information. The ones that did were ones that were easily um, ruled out. But again, some people that are really good suspects for this were also ruled out with DNA. So who knows? Who knows? I mean, I could go on and on and on. I will not because I just don't, like I was saying to Dave, I don't want to um, spend more than two episodes talking about all these people that were ruled out based on one thing or another. I will leave that to the experts, like my friend here, One Salt, because this person, he has really gone above and beyond with some of this stuff. I mean, digging up information from every resource that you can find about this case. And a lot of that on that aforementioned website, because this is pretty much a repository for anything that you would want to know or see or find out about the uh, JonBenet Ramsey case. So I'm actually, I will throw a link in the comments um, for that Candy Rose website so you guys can check it out if you feel so inclined. Um, Gina, I'm not sure. Again, I know that um, I, I think the number that I saw of people that were looked into on this was 200. But again, I don't know. 
Um, it could be more, it could be less. I'm not sure. Um, yeah. So what do you guys got? Like, wh who do you like for this? What do you guys think happened? Cause I want to kind of open this up and make it more of a discussion rather than me talking at you. So, um, what do you think? Do you, uh, do you buy into the intruder theory? Do you think that somebody walked in or broke in and committed this crime? Or do you think that the family had something to do with it? Do you think that Patsy murdered John Bonet in a fit of rage by accident? Do you think John was inappropriate with his daughter somehow and, you know, things went too far? Or do you think that Burke got sick of playing second fiddle to his younger sister and something happened. Who knows? All right. We got a vote for intruder, Karen. I like it. Um, do any of the uh, people of interest that we spoke about on tonight's episode really jump out at you? <clears throat> yes, that's right. Hundreds of names on it, but didn't he have a short list once solved? I feel like there was a short list given and I'm dying to know um, on his deathbed, he told, I believe it was one of his daughters, this is the name you should start with. I want to know what the name is. Um, I don't have a name for that guy. So that is Amy's case. Let's talk about that pretty briefly before we sign off tonight. Um, Amy is not her real name. Um, Amy is not her real name. Uh, Amy is the name that she was given in reports about this because they were trying to protect her identity. Um, she was a minor. They're not going to talk about who she was in public resources, but um, she was attacked on September 14th, 1997, which is not terribly long after Jean Benet's murder. Um, she only lived a few blocks away. It was a very similar attack. Um, she was, uh, sexually assaulted while she was in bed. Um, Amy and Jean Benet went to the same dance school. They knew each other. Um, and then again, in a case of the Boulder PD sort of not really doing their job correctly, they threw away the sheets, um, from Amy's bed after the assault. So there was no way for them to get DNA on this. Okay. Yep. I knew, I knew one solve would have something. All right. The name was fucking up. It was a family with a business grudge against John. Mm. Okay. So that's, that's who you like for it. One solve. You think it's a Henderson thing? I, I saw your episodes about the Hendersons. It seems like, um, that's, it seems like that's uh, the way that you're thinking on this. And I, I tend to agree that if it wasn't, um, if it wasn't anyone in the family and you can definitively rule out Michael Holt, Michael uh, Holgraf, Holgath, what the hell is his name? Helgoth. Sorry. If you can't, if you can rule out Michael Helgoth a hundred percent, then yeah, I think that John Douglas has a point with a business grudge. And I think that the only people who had a sizable business grudge against John Ramsey was the Henderson family. Um, Jeff Merrick. Yeah, that's another um, that's another person, Jeff Merrick, I was going to get into. But again, not tons of information about him. I like Sandra more for this, but I don't think that she worked alone. I think that she had a lot of people helping her. Um, namely some kids, uh, one of her kids or one of her stepkids because of the presence of that black Jaguar we talked about. So you don't buy into Burke unsafe. <clears throat> I was, I, I admit I, when I saw Jim Clemente's special, because again, you guys, if you've watched my channel, um, you know how I feel about Jim Clemente, but, um, I, I will watch anything he puts out there because I think he's a very, very smart man. Um, but I don't think that he got it right with Burke. I, I agree with you. Um, but it is intriguing to think that if Burke had something to do with this, it's very understandable that his parents would 
help him cover it up because they would do anything for their kids, right? I mean, it's said on multiple occasions. But again, like, I just, I don't see it personally. But what do you guys think? Like, are there, is anyone in here still, um, is anyone in here convinced fully that the family had something to do with this, that they're, um, they're responsible? Hi, Becca. Thanks for joining. Um, okay. This is interesting. Um, the Hendersons hired a hitman. I, so I didn't get too far into Daryl Kirkwood. Um, but I do remember hearing that he was ignored by Boulder PD, which seems to be their MO because again, like, and going through this from inception to, you know, now it's very obvious that there's a lot of, um, a lot of things that came to the Boulder PD's attention that they sort of try to ignore, especially Lou Smith, honestly, <laughs> him saying like, well, I'm pretty sure the parents actually didn't do this. Well, um, he's, he's gone from, I mean, he's, he's passed away now, but he left the, the investigation because he did not agree with the police's theory that the Ramseys had something to do with this. So again, we've got people on both sides that are convincing. So it's hard to know. I mean, personally, I, I think it was an intruder, um, whether it was directly the person with an ax to grind with John Ramsey or, um, any kind of issue with the family. I don't know. They could have been somebody that was hired. I like one solves theory about this. I'm going to look further into Daryl Kirkwood and I urge you guys to, uh, to do the same whether it's through One Solves videos or the massive archive on a, a candyrose.com. Um, but do, do some research, like make your opinion based on what you find, based on what convinces you, um, because I'm not 100% either. So, and you guys know how much I love to say I'm not 100%. So, um, yeah, he did, exactly. Um, and on his deathbed, he was passing on information about this case to his daughters. Like that is commitment. I, if, if nothing else, the man was incredibly committed. Um, Tracy, what makes you unsure? I'm curious. Um, because I, I, like, I, again, I'm sort of convinced that it was an intruder but I was pretty convinced up until recently that it was the family. So it's, um, it's easy to find information to bolster your own theory, but it's also easy to find a lot of information that's going to make you go the other way. So I would love, I would love to know your thoughts guys. Like if anyone's got some comments that they want to um, questions that they want to ask, whatever, before we, um, so this up, we've done about almost four hours on this case. Um, yeah, he was a legend. He absolutely was a legend. One solved. I would love to pick your brain more actually on this. Um, I am going to, maybe I'll send you a, I don't know how to send you a message, but, um, I'll find a way to get in touch because I would love to talk more about this with you. And if you'd be willing, I'd love to, to maybe have you on, um, you know, it's, it's up to you completely. Um, but I would love to talk about this more with you. Definitely. Uh, it would have to be someone with an ax to grind. Otherwise the ransom note is too strange to come from anyone, but the parents. That is a good point. That's a really good point. Who, who knew? Um, I will email you one solved. I would love to talk to you more. Yeah. If you can't, um, link your own YouTube, I will do it for you. Definitely, because I love your videos. Um, okay, so let's see. What else does everybody... Hi, Smitty. Thanks for coming. Thank you for coming. Um, let's see. One solved. Where are you? Hold, please, guys. Because I'll, I'll pull up a link for you guys. Mm -mm. It is, um, the channel is awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. 
whoops, mystery singular. There we go. There you are. Okay, I'm going to throw this up in the chat. And so you guys can take a look. Um, throw my, my, my friend here a sub, please. Um, don't forget to hit the like on your way out. Um, I really, really love to get some more subscribers where our numbers are not huge, but, um, I love every single one of you guys. You're amazing. Um, yeah. Okay. So what else do we have? Let's see. Although there have been many, yeah, that's another thing that really, that, that made, you know, that made me consider other angles about this ransom note too, is, is the taunt. Um, there's a lot of prolific killers that get off on taunting their victims or the families of their victims. That's, that's a big thing. Well, you know what guys, our numbers may be small, but I, I appreciate the hell out of every single one of you. This is, this is mind blowing, like absolutely mind blowing. Our, our sub numbers, I think are like 260, I think, or just under, and it blows my mind every single day that 260 people in this world exist that are willing to come and spend two hours on a Friday night and watch my funny looking face talk about horrible, horrific murders and deaths. So it, like you guys, you're, uh, I can't, I'm going to start blushing and possibly crying. So I'm not going to do that, but <clears throat> I sincerely appreciate every single one of you stopping, watching for a few, watching for the whole two hours. Like this is amazing. Um, oh, also I just wanted to grab this from unsafe because this is some, um, this is a weird thing. This is a weird, weird thing. Um, the, the ransom note was written on, on paper from a pad that was found to be Patsy's that was in the house. Um, there were a couple there were impressions on, um, thank you, Ben. There were impressions on the other paper in the pad that showed that um, more drafts had been written, but the person might have taken them with them. Um, there was one draft that had started, um, that had been started that was found on the pad. So it was just addressed Mr. and Mrs. Ramsey, the one that was discarded on the pad. Um, so like, again, I, what I think is that the, the letter was written ahead of time, meaning ahead of the actual crime, but I think it was written in the house while they were waiting for the Ramseys to come home from dinner. Um, but that's my thoughts. So let's see. Smitty says, did you read Perfect Murder, Perfect Town? Yes, I did. So we talked about it a little bit. Um, it is a compelling read. There are lots of good quotes in there from people close to the family, close to the investigation, especially friends of the family. Um, it's interesting to get insights straight from them. Uh, there were things that were later proven wrong that were written in that book, but all in all, it, it's a great read. Personally, I, I really, really like it. <laughs> Seth Wogan. <laughs> Sorry, that's too good. Um, Becca, I'm just glad you came. I'm just, I'm glad all of you came. This, this is awesome. We've got great numbers tonight. So, um, I'm, I'm so, I'm so thankful for every single one of you. Um, oh, unsafe. That's a, that's a good point. And that goes to one other thing that I wanted to touch on before we sign off. Um, the person would have had to have spent a good amount of time in the house without worrying about being caught. Okay, so this black jaguar thing, um, to me, when I heard about it, so there's accounts of a black convertible jaguar being um, seen going up and down the dead end street that the whites lived on during the dinner that the Ramseys were present on the night of the murder. Now, that to me screams lookout car. 
Like, I think that somebody was there to scout that the Ramseys were still there so that maybe they could warn the person in the house when they leave somehow. I mean, this is pre-cell phones, so I don't know how they would warn them, but maybe they were there as a lookout. I don't know. Um, I love this. I love this conversation about my dear husband's nickname, because as we all know, he's Mr. Doves, but he's also the off-brand Seth Rogen. So um, we get it all the time and it's adorable, but I like Becca's Seth Rogen. Anyway, so um, they had cell phones. They were just huge. Yeah, I think we're talking like the 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 Zach Morris cell phone from uh, Saved by the Bell. Those big, big, giant ones. Um, they were around then. Yeah, that's true. That's true. That's true. Actually, someone with a Jaguar would have one. But would someone in the house risk carrying a cell phone? I mean, we also have... Um, what were those fucking thing, things called? The, um, the, um, uh, the next tells those, those little, um, they were like a two way radio slash cell phone. I mean, maybe they had something like that. Who knows? Ooh, stroganoff, huh? That's something, that's something to consider. I haven't had stroganoff since my husband and I were super poor, uh, when we were first living together, we used to eat hamburger helper, um, like a lot. <laughs> and that was one of those, um, oh, a beeper. That's another, mm. Mm. so, um, yeah, uh, I just, I did want to say for the people who are joining me, who watch the true, true crime and dying program that I do, um, I think I'm going to skip it this week. Uh, I've been on, this is my third um, live this week. And now we're, we're going on two hours for the almost third time this week. So I may, that's, um, oh yeah, I was going to talk again. Okay. One solved. We're going to chat because this is amazing. I was going to bring that up as well. So um, yeah, there was damage to the old elevator door. It's still, I believe, with the private investigator for the Ramsey family, um, unless it's been moved since then. But yeah, the, all, all you guys are so astute. I love this. I didn't even think about a beeper. I mean, they, they could have used a pager. They could have used a beeper. But I, I do think personally that, that the presence of that black Jaguar sort of casing the neighborhood. I mean, it's a dead end street. It's a dead end street. Who's going to be driving up and down a dead end street unless they're, I don't know, casing a place, looking for somebody who knows, but that feels nefarious to me. I'm on the Sean schedule. What does that mean? Flip phones out in 96. God, am I that old? Jeez, that I just, mm. I was 13 when there were cell phones. I don't, I don't, ugh. all right. Anyway, guys, um, unless you guys have something else that you want to talk about, you have questions, you have comments. Um, if you're truly dying for another true crime and dying, we can do Sunday night. Um, but I was thinking about skipping it. Um, who's they Becca, who are you talking about? Why would they want her killed? I want to know what they are referring to so I can tailor my answer. Ooh, excuse me. Um, yeah, Ellis Armistead. That's who. That's interesting. About the elevator door, I didn't think. Whoever. Why would anyone want her killed? Yeah, it, like that's that's the point, though. Who would want her killed? Who would willingly be involved with the death of a child, but, and, and not just the death of a child, but the death of a child in such a, a brutal manner. I mean, it's horrible. Right. And I just uh, like, no matter who could have done it, like I keep going down different avenues. Like maybe it was the family. Um, maybe it was an intruder. I personally think it was, but I, I do think that if it was an intruder that they intended to kidnap her, I don't think they intended to murder her. I think that it was, um, it was an intruder 
for whatever reason linked to whoever um, who meant to kidnap her for ransom. And I think she woke up and things went to shit. And I think she died as a result of trying to escape or fight back. Personally, that's what I think. If the family had something to do with it, I think it was an accident or um, maybe a rage killing. If it was a family member, I don't buy a purposeful, intentional killing by a family member. In this case, I personally don't. Um, oh yeah, the, the striking couple back East. That's another thing. I did, I found that interesting too. And, um, there was talk, maybe it was on your channel. It's all a blur now. Uh, but there was talk about that striking couple that looked like they could have been from back East, um, being Scott Carruthers. Um, but again, he was apparently in Baltimore at the time, so I don't know. But, um, yeah, it was, that's another weird thing. But again, like if you're looking for weird stuff, it's going to appear like the police are, and, and everybody else are asking John Ramsey, did anything stand out? Did anything stand out? It's people you've never seen before seeing them both at your church and at the restaurant you went to afterwards, that's going to stand out in your mind. Whether it was something related to the crime or just a coincidence, who knows? But at least he was being astute enough to vocalize what he noticed. I think that's good. Hubert. Um, yes, Becca, I agree. I think it was either, and I, I don't think that whoever killed her intended to, but I think once they started, they couldn't stop. That um, the method of, of murder here is just too brutal. Like it's, oof. A uh, relative or a close friend, someone she knew and trusted. That's, I mean, that would speak to her either going willingly and quietly down to the basement. That that definitely speaks to her trusting the person that she was with, for sure. Um, the number 118,000 definitely says it was someone close or at least someone familiar with John Ramsey's business. Um, yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think that striking couple from back east, um, I don't know if they were ever, ever able to determine who that was, but it, it certainly was something interesting. And yeah, especially for it to have happened before the crime is just um, another reason that it standing out is, is atypical. Definitely. So guys, all right, we've hit and passed that two hour mark. So I am going to sign off and um, take some decongestant because I'm starting to get blocked up right now. Um, but uh, let's, uh, I'll, I'll put a poll up on, um, on the True Crime Bloodhound Facebook and we'll talk, uh, I'll, I'll take a vote on another true crime and dine because maybe we'll go into a little bit of a little bit more detail on this case since I've been talking about it so much and thinking about it so much, but one solved, I'm going to be in touch because I would love to pick your brain some more. Um, I really, really appreciate you first of all, joining this live stream, but secondly, your knowledge and you're just, you're right on it all all night you've been right on it. So I appreciate you. Um, virtual handshake for you, bud. I, I, I loved it. Thank you so much for coming. Um, and all of you guys, thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Um, and we'll talk soon. Uh, hit the like, hit the sub on your way out, and maybe we'll cross another milestone tonight. All right. Uh, have a good night, guys. Enjoy your weekend. Happy St. Patrick's Day from uh, <laughs> one Irish to others. Enjoy, guys. Have a good one.